Isn't this fun? Yeah, this is great. Are we gonna dance? I hear the music <laughs> started already. I hope not. Yeah, no. <laughs> I don't have my right shoes on for that. Good morning, everybody. Good to, good to be here. It's fun. It's fun to be here in the, this morning. Be in a place of intelligence. You know, intelligent, intelligent uh, transportation. I thought I would start with a very important uh, question to frame the entire, and that is, uh, tonight's uh, Lions game. <laughs> what's, uh, what's the, what's the over-under? What's your prediction for the game tonight? <clears throat> Listen, it's going to be a blast. Uh, <clears throat> for those of you who don't know, my family owns the Lions, and... Um, There's a game tonight. There is yes. a big game tonight. It's against the Giants, and uh, the whole city is going to come alive. It's, it's great. It's so cool to be in Detroit today because <clears throat> we've got this conference, which really highlights uh, everything that's going on about the future of, of our industry and our city. Then we've got the Tiger game this afternoon, and they're in the middle of a pennant uh, race. And then the Lions tonight um, for uh, Monday Night Football. And the last time we played Monday Night Football, um, well, th that I remember uh, so vividly, was when we played the Bears a couple years ago. And it was so loud at Ford Field that the Bears couldn't get the snap count off. So I'm hoping we, uh, hope, hope we can duplicate that tonight. So your prediction is noise. A lot of noise, a lot of enthusiasm, and uh, it's going to be really fun. And I, I'm so happy for the city that uh, we're hosting big events like this, like the Tiger game and like the Lions game. So I, I noticed, though, no, no brash uh, predictions. <laughs> now, I know you, you make brash predictions about what you think is going to happen in the world of transportation. Absolutely. But, yeah. But so, I'm not foolish. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's, you know, the NFL is, is, is we saw yesterday, um, I mean, it's, the world gets turned upside down every single weekend. And so, uh, but I like our team. I think we're very well prepared, and I'm, I'm looking forward to tonight. Well, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to start, uh, start us uh, moving into the, the meat of this discussion, if that's okay. Some, some broad stuff at, at Fast Company Magazine, where we write mostly about uh, uh, innovation and technology and the way those sorts of changes can propel uh, progress in business and in culture. And um, there's been a lot of change. The velocity of change has been very uh, aggressive the last several years or so. Um, and some of our readers uh, have a lot of fun with that. They think it's exciting. Uh, they, uh, they see a lot of opportunity. And others, often in the larger legacy enterprises, find the degree of chaos uh, a little scary, uh, the uncertainty a little difficult. When you and I talked last week, you alluded to both sides of this a little bit. And I wanted to, I wanted to uh, read back to you a quote you said to me. You said, change is happening so fast, and I love it. So what do you love? I mean, this is the best time. And I've been at Ford for well over 30 years, I think 35 years. Well, I actually have been at Ford my whole life, I, I guess. <laughs> but um, but it, uh, I mean, this is, is by far the best time of my career. Uh, if you think of our company and our industry, we, we turned 100 years old in 2003, and from the time my great-grandfather founded Ford till the centennial, we hadn't had a lot of change. We'd had a lot of evolution, very few revolutions, um, and that's all changing now, and it's, I, it's, it's fantastic because uh, we're working on really interesting problems. Uh, you think about things like urban mobility in an ever more crowded world, going from 7 billion people to 9.5 billion people. You know, how are we going to move people? That's really interesting. Um, you think about making people's lives safer, making people's lives, uh, saving them time, saving them money. That's really interesting. Attracting the next generation of the best and the brightest. They want to work on interesting problems. We have those. We, not just Ford, but we, all of you, we all have that. Um, and it's, it's really, I, for me, the most exciting and breathtaking time but it requires us to be a very different kind of company than we've been. So the, um, the things that you love are, uh, are connected in some ways to things that you worry about. Absolutely. Right? You, you, you also talked to me about the, uh, the volume of cars on the road going mm -hmm. from one billion to two billion or more and what kind of challenges that creates, what that global gridlock might look yeah, like. and so I gave a TED talk a few years ago, and I, I started talking about something I coined global gridlock um, because nobody was focused on it within our industry at the time. Be and it used to drive me crazy because I'd sit in, in meetings and people would say, well, just look at the GDP growth in all these countries and then extrapolate that out with units sold, and we're going to be selling you know, unbelievable amounts of vehicles. And I kind of said, hey, time out. 
where are we going to put them? Where are we going to drive them? Uh, and how are they going to interact with each other? You know, you cannot shove, you know, two cars in every garage in Mumbai. Uh, in fact, you know, it, it's, it's preposterous. Uh, and, and that's true because there's another trend that's going on as we grow from seven billion to nine and a half. Uh, the world is also urbanizing. Uh, so the problems we see in the cities today are just gonna get that much more acute. So to me, it seemed like a really interesting and vital challenge that we had to undertake. How are we gonna solve this? And we really do, it's in, as an industry, we are almost on two parallel paths because on the one hand, we do have rising GDPs in developing nations, and we are selling more vehicles, uh, and there is opportunity to do that. But this parallel path is, you know, cities are struggling with transportation today, and they're going to struggle even more in the future, and the infrastructure, uh, and often the money isn't there to really fix the infrastructure, even if they knew how to fix it. So, um, you know, it's a, it's a very interesting uh, time we're in. And it's an inter interesting problem to solve. Uh, and, and, yeah. But you're in the business of selling as many cars and trucks as you can, right? We're in the business of providing. Look, I think any business only exists to make people's lives better, period. And at a certain point, shoving more vehicles into an urban environment isn't doing that. Uh, and so if, if we can, though, give people back their most precious commodity, which is time, uh, then that will be very cool, and we will serve society. And I, I look at it, you know, my great-grandfather, uh, Henry Ford, really believed in uh, the freedom of mobility, because prior to uh, the Model T, most people never traveled more than 25 miles from home in their entire lifetime, which is incredible. And all of a sudden, it, it really allowed people to choose where they worked, where they played, and, and uh, where they lived in a way they never could before. But that model of mobility is under severe threat. And we, therefore, need to uh, focus on that and help solve it and really redefine what mobility is for the coming century. So when, because I guess if you take the, the system the way we have it now and you envision the middle of this century, you see lots of vehicles like this, maybe with, with the sensors on them, which right, I guess sure. we'll get to, but sort of crowded, if nothing changes, it's, it's too crowded, it's too cramped, and the, the, the freedom of mobility that we get from those vehicles today doesn't actually happen? Or yeah, I mean, put it simply, today, you know, people who drive cars in daily commutes, they love their car and they hate, hate everybody else's. Um, and we, we, you know, that's not a great situation to be in. So, um, but we can, you know, through technology, I think we can really enable a, a, a sea change that's going to uh, you know, help solve some of these problems. There will be no one silver bullet, and I think everybody in this room knows that. And many of you are working on individual aspects of this. But ultimately, I believe that all forms of transportation are going to have to be in a single network, all talking to each other. I mean, think about this. Think about um, if you're in suburban New York and you, your cell phone tells you that your usual commute is going to take an extra hour because there are a couple accidents. So instead of driving to the city, you drive to the train station. Now, you don't have to uh, worry about paying for parking because your parking app has already found you the parking spot. You, you pay for it automatically. You then are ticketed to get on the, the commuter train, again through your cell phone, seamlessly, no cash transaction. You go into the city. It's raining out. You call Lyft or Uber, uh, you go out and have lunch, uh, come back, and then at the end of the day, you can reverse it. Um, you know, that to me is really connected transportation. And, and right now, I suppose I can do that, but it seems like a hassle. Well, it, it is, and there are pieces of that already starting to form, as you know, but it's not, everything is not integrated yet. Uh, and, and, and I believe that not only will it happen, it has to happen. So do, do you feel like the solutions, like the pieces of the solutions, we already have the technology well, we, for them? Well, we, ha we, we have a lot of that. I mean, we do. I mean, we, you, you know, whether it's vehicle to vehicle, vehicle to infrastructure, a lot of the apps that are being developed by mm -hmm. uh, companies uh, in this room, um, you know, a lot of those pieces are there, but what, you know, but not, it's not all there. I mean, we, autonomous driving there's still pieces that have to be developed that have to be ready for prime time that aren't quite ready yet. 
But I believe it's going to happen, and all this will become seamless. Uh, now, I, I know an, a, another uh, automaker here in town made an announcement yesterday about autonomous vehicle that was focused more on the safety uh, uh, that that could provide to drivers. You're, you're talking about it. I'm not saying you're, you're downplaying the safety, but you see a another or a larger purpose behind it? Well, yeah, I mean, there, there, are, there are multiple layers to all of this. I mean, first of all, you know, safety is a big deal, obviously. If we can make people's uh, lives safer, then that's really important. And a lot of the autonomous features we'll start to see going into the vehicles. You know, people always ask me, when are we going to have autonomous driving? And my answer is, by the time we actually get to that final step of full autonomy, it won't feel like such a big deal because so many of the features will already be coming in. And, uh, and, and those will be very much safety enhancements. We're doing it, other OEMs are doing it, um, and that's important. But then it's also important, not that only that the vehicle can be, have autonomous features, but the vehicle has to be in communication with other forms of transportation as well. So we really do get on a seamless network of transportation, a car being one piece of that, that element. I mean, I, I know that there were, there were uh, announcements the last couple of days of new partnerships between your, your company and others about uh, connected vehicles in Ann Arbor, a connected yeah. corridor uh, here, in, here, here in southern Michigan. Um, is, there a, is, there, like, is there a specific goal? Like, what does success look like for programs like that? Well, you know, it, it, a lot of this has to, is just about getting everybody on the same page. Okay. Um, and we, Ford, have a number of mobility uh, experiments going with partners around the world, uh, which we haven't announced yet, but we'll be announcing soon. Um, but it really, it's all about collaboration at a certain level because it doesn't do any good if Fords can only talk to Fords. Mm -hmm. um, or, you know, so we really have to have common languages. We have to have, um, you know, uh, and that's where the universities are really so important. You mentioned, you know, the collaboration we have with the University of Michigan and, and the OEMs and uh, the Connected Corridor here in Michigan, which again is about collaboration. And, you know, we, the OEMs, you know, fight each other tooth and nail every day in the marketplace. But at a certain level, we also cooperate and have to cooperate on a lot of uh, these big issues as we start thinking about building out the infrastructure, building out the sensors, all those kinds of things. The capability to receive information has to be pretty much the same across uh, vehicle uh, manufacturers. So there's a lot of competition. There's also a lot of collaboration, um, and it has to be that way. And, and when, I, when, I, um, when I read and I try to understand what, what, the, what these connected corridors and the way all the vehicles will talk to each other uh, really means, it, 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 it sounds like uh, there's a lot of data about me driving that um, the road's going to know, other people are going to know, other cars are going to know. Um, what, what's the privacy policy around this? Can I opt out of being part yeah, of a connected system? Yeah, I mean, system? I, I, think, I think that's always a big issue for, as we enter this new world that we're all in here in this room, um, privacy is a big deal. And, you know, I, we believe at Ford that, you know, opting in is important. Um, and so that people do have that comfort. Um, and so uh, this is something that we're working through as we work through this. And we're working it through with a lot of, a lot of the companies and, uh, institutions that are that are here, uh, but I do yes, opting in and opting out I think is very important. I mean it's it and, and and by the way, you know a lot of this really cool technology that that this audience I think really is interested in, it kind of freaks some people out, um, <laughs> and you know and and some people you know you, they they hear autonomous driving and they say oh my God I never want to get into that vehicle. Um, other people say, you know, um, I don't want my car talking to other cars. I mean, that's, that's terrible. So there's, you know, we have to do this thoughtfully because um, there are early adopters for all these technologies, and I suspect this room is filled with early adopters. Um, but, you know, we also have, uh, you know, another reality in that we have an aging population um, and that may not be as tech savvy, and we need to make it okay for them too. Mm -hmm. And so, uh, again, that's why it's also important for levels of opt-in, because some people just simply cannot and don't want to get comfortable with the kind of technology that gets me excited and you excited. Um, and we have to recognize that. I mean, we, we make vehicles uh, for everyone of every age uh, and every driving experience. And we can't leave some people behind because we uh, load up too much technology. And, and frankly, 
you know, we already see that sometimes where people come into our dealerships and say, I just want the radio to work. And I don't know how to do any of the rest of this stuff. Um, and so um, we, you know, part of our job collectively in this room is to make it easy and seamless for those people so that they're not afraid of technology. And to make, I guess, the, uh, the, the new technology that's, that's in the vehicle protected enough so that you can do more in the vehicle, but the vehicle protects you from being distracted from what you're, from your driving. I mean, these uh, are... No, agreed, and, and these are all big issues. Um, the more the, autonomous my vehicle, the more I can text, right? <laughs> True. Uh, we hope. And, I, I, well, and, and I, by the way, I, I, I saw just. I, I, I'm I, I saw an kids, accident you know, yesterday yes. that a guy passed me on the road texting and hit a tree. Uh, I mean, it was awful to see, and he thankfully was fine. But yeah, I mean, it's it's. I mean, right now you got to have eyes on the road, hands on the wheel, and it's going to be that way for a while, even as we start putting in a lot of these features that will assist you. The driver still has to be vigilant and in control. I mean, is the is is your ultimate vision that uh, that uh, autonomous vehicles from Ford will be like Google's driverless car, where you can engage something and it'll just take you there, and you can text and you can well, watch movies? Well, you know, it's, it's one thing to do it's one thing to do it in a, in a controlled environment, and I think you know this vehicle can do that. Other vehicles can do it. The, you know, you mentioned Google, and and we, we're all working on that. But it's very different to put it in an uncontrolled environment that isn't well mapped, that has you know, severe weather. Um, and you know, we have to make very sure that under every possible condition uh, and, and that our vehicles can truly do that. And until we are that sure, uh, we're going to have the driver in control assisted by a lot of these autonomous uh, uh, features, which will get proven out over time. And, and, and so ultimately, uh, you know, autonomous driving, pure, pure autonomous driving, when we get there, won't seem like such a big deal because people will already be familiar with so many of the features. So as um, between autonomous driving and uh, sensors on the roads and all of these other uh, new changes that will create intelligent systems, um, it's, it, it's a lot of money that's going to cost to get us to this world. Hey, there are a lot of entrepreneurs who are going to make a lot of money. Uh, <laughs> You know, who, so who, who pays for this, though? I mean, is it, is it entrepreneurs? Is it users, people who buy cars? Is it government? Like, where, industry, well, every, where does this come from? Well, the from? answer is yes to all of that. Um, and, uh, you know, and, and I think that's not unusual. You're going to have uh, governments helping with infrastructure issues. You're going to have companies like ours spending a ton of money on R&D uh, and, um, and, and, and proving it out. You will have a lot of collaboration between um, young companies, established companies, and universities, and that's already happening, and government entities all coming together. Um, and then entrepreneurs, you know, I, I formed my own venture capital fund with my partners uh, five years ago because I could see this trend coming. Um, and it was, to me, very clear where this industry had to head. Five years ago, I don't think it was clear to a lot of people. So we formed this VC partly to get comfortable with all this technology, um, and it's been really interesting, um, and it's been very, for me, really, really fun to come into contact with so many incredibly bright young entrepreneurs who are doing some awesome stuff in this space. And that really is our future. You know, one of the things that we realized at Ford that I realized early on is we don't have to be, nor should we be, the inventor of this technology. Um, we can be on pieces of it, but we don't have to be, but what we have to be is a really nimble integrator uh, of technology. And that means we have to be able to work with companies. To, you know, you look at, our, look at our industry. Traditionally, our industry has not worked well with smaller companies. Um, you know, we work with big tier one suppliers that provide us axles and engines and engine parts and those kinds of things. Uh, and, and that's great. And those, and those are still doing that. But if we're really going to be successful as a company, we have to. Uh, know how to work with a very young company, uh, to not overload them with requests, to, mm. not, to realize that they're financially uh, not capable of, of us, you know, giving Saying them we love this and can, can I have Yeah, and I'd like six prototypes week? by tomorrow. Right, uh, yeah. yeah. Um, and so, you know, it really is, it's, it's, a, it's a shift in our company we, uh, in terms of how we interact with uh, this new world. I'm very, I'm very happy with how the early results are, but we've got, we've still got a ways to go. 
So, um, you know, earlier decades ago, you, you raised uh, red flags about environmental issues. Yep. Um, didn't always make you popular about certain things. Um, with all of these uh, vehicles that are going to be on the road in the, over the next several decades, is, is the environmental issue more pressing than the traffic and crowding issue? Or, or do you feel like we've sort of solved the zero emission problem? Where, where do those things That's, that's really out? interesting. Well, you point out, you know, I was an environmentalist when I joined Ford and, and was uh, roundly castigated by everybody. Um, the enviro environmentalists thought I was a wolf in sheep's clothing and the people in, in Detroit thought I was crazy. So um, You made a lot uh, of friends. Yeah, I made a lot guys. of friends. Yes. But ultimately, we, we, we persevered and, and it really worked out. And, and, and you know, the day that I saw coming, actually, you know, we, we've made tremendous progress. And, uh, but I remember when we've, we issued our first uh, corporate uh, sustainability report and the headlines on the paper was Bill Ford criticizes his own company because we went through in our report and looked at all the things we were doing and, and said where we weren't living up to where we need to go. And we set tar hard targets and we do this every year now. Um, and people have come along now with that. Um, and, but when I said at the TED talk um, that we were headed for a global gridlock, I got much the same response. Wait, wait, time out. You're talking about you know, the, the limits on selling cars? You know, you can't do that. And, um, but, but we are going to do it. We have to do it. And, um, and, and it's interesting to see it's how rapidly people are starting to uh, focus on this issue. But on the environmental issue, um, you know, we've come a long, long, long way. Uh, you, you think of, you know, even you know, the internal combustion engine's much cleaner. We've, uh, you know, all the, you know, it's interesting, if we were talking a few years ago, we'd probably be talking about cellulosic ethanol as a way of powering our cars, and a few years before that, we'd be talking about hydrogen. Mm -hmm. um, and now we're focusing on electric, and, and, you know, and I think that's good. I think electric is, is probably the, the way to go. The problem, though, is we need a national discussion on how we're going to build out our power grid, because, um, so it's a long way of answering your question. We can be there with the technology, we, we the auto industry. We can deliver pure electric vehicles, we can deliver plug-in hybrids. Um, but if we're, you know, coal-powered uh, power plants are being built to, to uh, fire up our electric vehicles, then that's probably not the greatest solution. So we've got to have a national discussion in terms of what we want our, our grid to look like, how we're going to power it. Um, and we really do need an energy policy um, that's forward, that looks long term in this country. And it's, it's hard to do. I mean, you know, it's hard in Washington to, to have a, a long term. You know, we're fortunate in our state. We've got some, um, I, I see Senator Stabenow here who's been working on this for some time. And uh, our, our delegation has been really good about focusing on our issues as, as an industry and as a nation. Um, but it, it would be very helpful if we had some clarity in terms of how we are going to power the power plants. Because my fear is that we, we electrify the fleet and, um, and, we, the, the, impact and is, the impact environmentally isn't what it, what it could be. So um, I know we don't have too much more time. I, I, I did want to ask you this question. So if, if the mission of Ford is about uh, mobility, Yep. And mobility includes everything from trains to bicycles to data and software. Is the future of Ford as much as a software and data company? It could as be. As it is? Yeah, it could be. I mean, I, I, look, we'll always be a hardware provider of some sort, um, but very much so, and an integrator uh, of all those things. Again, we may not have to, and we probably won't be the originator of it, but we also don't want to just be a black box for everybody else's technology. I mean, I think, you know, we don't want to be the handset um, of, you know, and, and where everything, else, all the value is, is elsewhere. So there's, a, there's an interesting balance in there that, frankly, we're still working through. Uh, and I suspect other companies are working through, too, in terms of, um, you know, where is the value added? What do we need to own? What don't we need to own? What can we just, you know, give away? What can we price for? All those kinds of things. And we, frankly, don't have all the answers yet. Um, but those are the discussions that are taking place. And to me, you know, rather than be frightened by it, I think it's really cool. I mean, you and I had a conversation last uh, week where, you know, I was at as, uh, a green conference uh, four or five years ago, and, and the, founder, uh, the CEO of Zipcar was there, Scott Griffith. Mm -hmm. And 
he followed me speaking, and when he came off, I said to Scott, I'd like to have coffee with you and to figure out how we can work together. And he said, did you hear my speech? I talked about taking cars off the road. Um, and I said, yeah, but it's going to happen with or without us, and I'd like to have it w happen with us. So as a result, Zipcar and Ford are now on over 250 college campuses together, uh, reaching a demographic for us that has traditionally been hard to reach. Um, and so it was a win-win. And that's how I look at all these, because we haven't even touched on sharing. Um, and, you know, the, the sharing economy, and, yeah. uh, you know, whether it's Lyft and Uber, or, you know, Zipcar, Relay Rides, uh, you know, there's all kinds of uh, interesting mobility um, projects out there. Not projects, they're, they're big companies up and running and running well. But again, rather than be frightened by that, um, we need to embrace it and work with those companies and help make their companies better companies. Um, and, and so, you know, Look, it doesn't do any good for us to try and ring fence our company or our industry and say, this is who we are and you cannot come in. Guess what? Disruption's happening every day and it's gonna happen even faster and faster and faster. And we can choose to be energized by it and, and find a way to um, make potential foes our friends or we can try and ignore it, which you know, in the past has been kind of what the auto industry has done. But it's happening with or without us, and I love the fact that we're participating. Well, I, uh, I, I love your enthusiasm, and uh, I realize we could have this conversation for another two hours, but, um, but our time is up. So um, thank you very well, Bob, much. Bob, thank doing you this. so much. Really thank a lot you. of fun. Thanks. Have a lot of fun, guys. Thank you, guys. Thank Thanks. you.